Every major dinosaur fossil, T-Rex, Velociraptor, even Archaeopteryx, captures the same eerie moment. Head snapped back, jaws locked wide, tail arched like they saw the end coming. The only fossil that truly proves dinosaurs died screaming is not a one-off. It is a worldwide pattern. More than 70% of articulated skeletons show this unnatural final pose, demanding an explanation more chilling than museum labels ever admit. So what forced these prehistoric giants into frozen agony, and why does every expert keep arguing about it? Let's unravel the evidence hiding in plain sight. Step inside any natural history museum and you will spot the same scene on repeat. Towering above the crowd, Chicago's T-Rex Sue looks like she just saw her own tax bill. Head yanked so far back it is almost showing off. Jaws stretched wide, tail pointing skyward as if she is about to launch. Across the country, the Velociraptor at the American Museum of Natural History strikes the same pose, mouth agape, neck arched, tail rigid. Even the Berlin Archaeopteryx, barely the size of a chicken, is frozen with its beak flung open in a silent scream. This is not just a few unlucky dinosaurs, this is the default setting. Paleontologists have counted. More than 70% of articulated dinosaur skeletons, from the smallest bird ancestor to the biggest sauropod, end up in this exact arrangement. That is not a coincidence. It is a global calling card, stamped across continents and species. The pattern is so consistent that even veteran fossil hunters get spooked. Terry T. Bone Brown, the Field Museum's legendary prepper tourer, once put it bluntly, Sue died like she meant it. Fixing the posture would change how she died and how she goes on display. The debate over whether to fix these postures for public comfort has filled more curator meetings than you would think. Some worry the pose is too dramatic for school groups. Others say it is dishonest to hide the truth. But the truth is hard to ignore when it is staring you down with a mouthful of a fossilized teeth. If your last selfie looked this dramatic, you would make history too. But here's the twist. This is not a one-off accident, or a weird quirk of fossilization. It is a forensic signature. Why would so many dinosaurs, in so many places, end up in what looks like the world's most uncomfortable yoga pose? If water, mud, and time are just rolling the dice, why do the dice come up screaming dinosaur almost every time? The answer has kept scientists arguing for over a century, and the stakes go way beyond museum aesthetics. Something in the fossil record is screaming for attention. The real mystery is not just how these creatures died, but why their agony was preserved for us to see. Crack open the fossil record and the evidence leaps off the slab. The most dramatic detail is not the size of the bones or the teeth, it is the way the skeletons themselves are twisted and locked. Start with the neck. In dinosaur after dinosaur, the cervical vertebrae are not just bent, they are hyperextended, stacked almost end to end, craning the skull backward far beyond what any living animal could manage. This is not a gentle tilt, it is a forced arch, like someone yanking back on a lever until it locks and will not budge. The jaw tells the same story. Instead of relaxing shut, the jaws are pried open to the anatomical limit, sometimes so wide the lower jaw nearly touches the neck. This is not a yawn or a bite, it is a gape frozen in place, the kind of thing you would expect from a creature caught in a final, desperate gasp. The mandible does not just hang loose, it is wedged open, held by tension even as the rest of the body slumps into the ground. And then there is the tail. In life, dinosaur tails were heavy, muscular, and mostly horizontal. Think of T-Rex balancing its body like a seesaw. But in the death pose, the caudal vertebrae are curved sharply upward, sometimes forming an arc that almost mirrors the neck. The tail does not droop or, sp or sprawl, it is pulled tout, vertebra by vertebra, as if the animal tried to lift itself off the ground in its last moments. Limbs, on the other hand, are all over the place. Some are tucked in tight, others splayed out or twisted. There is no pattern there, no ballet of rigor mortis, no neat arrangement. But the neck, jaw, and tail? Always the same trio of tension. Even in birds and small theropods, this pattern holds. Archaeopteryx, the so-called first bird, is immortalized with its beak stretched wide and its spine bent like a bow. The consistency is uncanny. Across continents, across species, across millions of years, the same anatomical story is written in bone. 
These are not display decisions by museum staff. These are biological facts, set in stone long before anyone thought to hang a plaque. The real puzzle is why. Why does this specific, excruciating pose keep turning up in every corner of the Mesozoic world? Whatever the answer, it is not just a fluke of how bones fall. Something inside the animal, at the moment of death, locked these joints into their final, unmistakable configuration. Early dinosaur detectives had a tidy explanation. Water did it. The idea was simple. When a river floods or a carcass washes downstream, the lighter parts of the animal, like the head and tail, get pushed around by the current. Supposedly, the skull floats back, the tail drifts up, and voila, instant death pose. For decades, this was, was the go-to answer. If you found a dinosaur with its neck cranked and tail sky high, you could blame it on a prehistoric lazy river. But here is where things get soggy. If water really called the shots, you would expect chaos, not choreography. Limbs would point every which way, ribs would scatter, and the whole skeleton would look like a jigsaw puzzle after a cat attack. Instead, the neck and tail are always the stars of the show, twisted with surgical precision, while everything else is a mess. In some fossil beds, dozens of skeletons lie belly down, side by side, or even on their backs, all in the same dramatic pose, despite facing different directions and showing no sign of being swept along. Buoyancy and drag should randomize the bones, not line up the same three features in animal after animal. Even in places where water barely trickled in, or where the sediment settled quietly, the death pose appears like clockwork. The pattern is too selective, too consistent, and frankly, too weird for water to take all the credit. If this was just a case of dinosaurs going for a swim, paleontologists would not still be arguing about it a century later. Paleontologists, never once to leave a mystery unsolved or a chicken untested, turn to the mechanics of dinosaur anatomy for answers. The next theory on the autopsy table is simple. Ligament contraction. The joke goes that you could try this at home if you do not mind scaring your neighbors. New shell ligaments are the tough elastic bands that run along a bird or small animal neck. After death, the idea goes, those ligaments dry, shrink, and pull the head backward, producing a slow motion arch. In lab experiments, researchers left bird carcasses to dry and documented gradual curling of the neck, sometimes producing a posture suspiciously close to the infamous dinosaur death pose. Death pose. It is a neat trick, and it works sometimes. But here is where the tidy explanation starts to unravel. The same contorted posture shows up in deserts, swamps, volcanic ash beds, and ancient seabeds, places with wildly different drying and decomposition rates. Some animals were buried so quickly their flesh barely had time to cool, let alone dry. Others lay exposed for days. Yet the same posture keeps turning up, as if the ligaments were following a script written in stone. Clincher. When scientists cut the nuchal ligaments in test animals, the pose never forms. No matter how long the carcass dries, the neck stays limp. Most dinosaur fossils show no sign that these ligaments were damaged before burial. Global Pattern If ligament recoil is the answer, it is a picky one, requiring perfect conditions, intact tissues, and just the right amount of time. That is a lot to ask from a process that must explain a worldwide pattern. So if drying ligaments cannot tie up this mystery, maybe something deeper is pulling the strings. In 2007, two paleontologists, Kevin Padian and Cynthia Foe, walked into the dinosaur death pose debate and tossed a medical curveball. Instead of blaming water or drying ligaments, they pointed to something that makes ER doctors nervous, opisthotinus. Opisthotinus is the technical term for a body arched backward in a full body spasm the same posture seen in severe cases of tetanus, meningitis, or strychnine poisoning. The twist is this. In modern medicine, opisthotinus is a neurological emergency, not a side effect of getting wet or drying out. Padian and Foe scoured the medical literature and the fossil record, comparing dinosaur skeletons to patients in hospital beds and animals in veterinary textbooks. The match was uncanny. In both cases, the neck cranks back, the jaw gapes, and the spine locks in a dramatic arch. It is not just a look, it is a symptom. When the brainstem loses its oxygen supply, it loses control over the muscles that keep the body relaxed. The result is a sudden violent contraction of the extensor muscles, pulling the head and tail into that signature arc. 
The jaw, too, flies open as the muscles seize. In humans, opisthotonus is a sign that you are in serious trouble. In dinosaurs, it appears to be their last recorded act. This was not just a new theory, Hamid. It was a new category. Instead of taphonomy, the science of what happens after death, Padian and Foe drag the conversation into neurophysiology and what happens in those final, conscious moments. Their argument was clear. The death pose is not a geological accident or a slow motion ligament trick. It is a biological fingerprint written by the nervous system as it crashes from lack of oxygen. If you have ever seen a chicken after a fox attack, or a scene from a medical drama where things go south fast, you have seen Opus Thoughtness in action. Padian summed it up with the kind of understatement only a paleontologist could manage. It looks exactly like the animals are suffering and dying. Cynthia Foe did not mince words either. This is not an accident of preservation. This is a biological, not a geological phenomenon. Suddenly, the dinosaur death pose was not just weird, it was a clue, pointing straight to the cause of death. Of course, if you are a dinosaur, you would probably prefer to skip that particular medical drama. For science, however, it was a breakthrough that demanded experimental proof. What exactly could push a creature that size into such a violent, unmistakable pose? And how could anyone test it without a time machine or at least a very forgiving chicken? Alicia Cutler at Brigham Young University wasn't content to let the dinosaur death pose remain a matter of armchair debate. She wanted action, preferably involving chickens, buckets, and a stopwatch. In her lab, the experiment was simple. Take a freshly dead chicken, drop it in water, and watch what happens. The result? Within seconds, the bird's neck snapped backward, the beak gaped wide, and the tail arched up. An uncanny echo of every museum dinosaur on the planet. No waiting for days of drying, no complicated chemistry, just a brief swim in the infamous pose locked in place. If you're wondering, this is the only time in science where dunk your chicken might be considered a legitimate research method. But the drama didn't end in the lab. Out in the field, the fossil record doesn't just offer single cases, it delivers entire tragedies. At Alberta's Pipestone Creek, paleontologists uncovered the Pachyrhinosaurus bone bed a graveyard holding the remains of over 1,000 individuals. Most of the bones are scattered, but here and there a rare articulated skeleton turns up still locked in that same backward arching pose. The sheer scale is staggering. Hundreds of tons of bone, all testifying to a mass event so sudden that some animals died and were buried before the heart or bodies could fall apart. It's not just Alberta. Bone beds from Mongolia, Utah, and Argentina tell similar stories. Whenever a group of dinosaurs dies together and the skeletons are preserved intact, Opisthotonus is right there, front and center. What Cutler's experiments proved is that the mechanism is fast, seconds, not hours. What the bone beds prove is that the mechanism can play out on a population scale. It is not a private agony, it is a mass signature stamped across entire herds. The same snap that happens in a lab chicken happens in a Cretaceous swamp only on a scale that would make Colonel Sanders nervous. The alignment between lab and field is hard to ignore. Whether you are a chicken in a tub or a dinosaur caught in a flood, the story ends the same way. Head thrown back, mouth open, tail in the air, a fossilized exclamation mark at the end of the world's worst day. CT scans have taken the dinosaur death pose from dramatic to downright unsettling. When paleontologists put articulated fossils through high-resolution imaging, they do not just see bones, they find ghostly outlines of what once filled those rib cages. Sometimes sediment sits packed deep in the chest cavity, right where lungs would have been. In a few cases, the sediment aligns with the trachea and main airways, suggesting that whatever buried these animals did not just cover them up, it filled their last breath. That is not proof of a peaceful passing, that is a snapshot of panic. Lungs drawing in mud, ash, or dust in a final, useless gasp. Step back and the real killer comes into view. The sky itself. This is planetary. The end of the Cretaceous was not just a bad day for dinosaurs, it was a planetary disaster. When the Chicxulub asteroid slammed into what is now Mexico, it vaporized rock and shot trillions of tons of dust, soot, and sulfur into the atmosphere. Sunlight dimmed. Temperatures plunged. The air thickened with particles sharp enough to shred lungs and fine enough to block every breath. 
geologists have traced layers of glassy spherules and iridium around the globe, a chemical fingerprint of instant fallout. Volcanic eruptions at the end of the Permian did something similar, pumping the skies full of ash and toxic gases for years on end. The result was not a gentle decline. Oxygen levels in the air did not just dip, they crashed in pockets, creating zones where breathing was a losing game. In those moments, death was neither gentle nor quiet. Animals caught in the open struggled to breathe, their nervous systems short-circuiting in the chaos. The opisthotonic pose, neck locked back, jaws wrenched wide, is not a fossil parlor trick. It is the body s last ditch response to suffocation, a full system spasm as the brain runs out of air. Some fossils preserve this agony in chilling clarity, sediment pressed into every hollow where breath once moved. Others record it in scale, whole bone beds echoing the same silent scream. The evidence from the micro to the global points to a world where the air itself turned deadly, and dinosaurs died not just in darkness, but in the grip of their own bodies. Today, every fossil in a museum is silent testimony that mass extinction is not some distant, painless event. It is a story written in trauma, still echoing in stone. As we face accelerating biodiversity loss, these ancient death throes warn us. Extinction is suffering on a scale we can barely imagine. The evidence is not buried. It is on display, daring us to recognize the cost before history repeats itself. 